as Sue mentioned, I'm Jenya. Um, I'm the deputy director here at Viva, um, and I am just incredibly excited about today's ILL Forum program. Um, and I'm also really pleased today to be the one to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Jill Hurst Wall. Uh, Jill is a consultant, a speaker, a writer, a researcher, and an educator. Um, whose interest in copyright was born out of her work as a copyright librarian, as well as her work with libraries on their digitization programs. She is a professor emerita in Syracuse University's School of Information Studies, where she has taught graduate level library and information science courses um, with a focus on copyright for information professionals. She is the former director of the iSchools MSILS program and a current member of the Onondaga uh, County Public Library Board of Trustees, the Every Library Institute, and the Library Futures Institute. You can find her blog at Digitization 101. And we are so excited to hear what Jill has to share with us today um, in her talk titled uh, Copyright and ILL, Change is Inevitable. Um, if during the presentation, as Sue mentioned, you have questions, please do enter them into the chat and I'll make sure to ask them of Jill at the end of the presentation. Um, and uh, with that, I'm very happy to turn it over to Jill. Thank you very much. And give me a moment while I share my slides. This is always the same thing that happens in person conferences where you know the, the speakers have to get up and shuffle things around so thank you for that moment one thing right off the bat um, it's a little bit intimidating to hear that the copyright questions are one of the topics that you always ask about and so as someone who really loves copyright law sometimes people have told me i love copyright law law too much I look forward to your questions. I know that some of you submit questions in advance. There was a, maybe a feedback form or a survey form, and I looked at those. And I've tried to include a few of those in my presentation, but I'm sure that there are many other questions. And so if you have questions about copyright, please put them in chat, and I will do my best to answer them at the end. Now, you'll notice that I changed the title of my presentation just a little bit and added the phrase and stagnation. Because I think as we look at copyright law and look at what has been happening with interlibrary loan, we see change over the years, but we also see stagnation. And I think that stagnation can be important. If we were in person, and I'd be looking out at all of you, I would ask you to raise your hands, but I'm gonna ask you just to think about the answers to this quick quiz. For which US president was the final CONTU report written? Now we've all heard about CONTU. We all use that acronym. Who was it written for? In the year that it was published, what means of energy production was suddenly being scrutinized? And finally, from the pop category, what smash hit did the NAC have in that year? So those three questions mean that you have to know something about when CON2 happened. And the year, was 1979. So let's look at um, 1979. I was very surprised to realize that the Department of Education was founded that year. Surely it's older than 1979, but it's not. The NAC had my Sharona, which is still, I'm sure, played on some radio stations. The Dukes of Hazard was a popular TV show, which I liked, but now in hindsight, I don't like that imagery that's in the show anymore. So it's interesting how our, how our interests, how, our, how what we find acceptable has changed 
since 1979. That means of production of energy was Three Mile Island and nuclear energy production. My family is from Harrisburg. I was born in Harrisburg, just north of Three Mile Island. And so I remember that, remember thinking about who was staying in Harrisburg and who was leaving. And interesting, um, at least in my family, the women left and the men felt the need to stay. Although they didn't understand what staying meant. Was radiation stopped by the brick walls? You know, did it affect food? Did it do whatever? People didn't know. Uh, but we're, we're here to talk about copyright and interlibrary loan, which brings us to this lovely group photo of most of the people who worked on Con2, both the commission itself and some staff members. And when you look at that photo, it really just stands out to me, the lack of diversity in that group. Now, there was at least one other woman in that group who was not in the photo, um, but there's not a lot of racial diversity. There doesn't seem to be a lot of cultural diversity, um, not a lot of gender diversity. And so if we were to do this again today, that group would look very, very different. And I wanna note that the gentleman in the back, um, Robert Wedgworth, was the ALA executive director at the time. Um, he is still living, he's active on Facebook. And uh, in a Facebook post several years ago, when I posted this photo, someone pointed him towards it and he looked at it and he said, you know, I don't know what I was thinking of to have that look on my face. But when I look at him, you know, the, the only person of color in this photo, um, I kind of put on him my thoughts of being the only person of color in that photo. And that's probably not what he was thinking. He was probably thinking about how awkward this photo was just to take or, you know, what was for lunch or something else. But those are the people, those are the people who did Kantu in 1979. And that's 42 years ago. So much has changed since 1979. So much has changed in 42 years. Now in 1979, I graduated from my undergraduate program. So I have lots of memories of 1979 besides Three Mile Island. Um, some of you may not have even been born before 1979. I don't know because I can't see you all in the audience. But 1979. Think about the technology changes that have occurred. And these two images give you a sense of those changes. The fact that in 1979, yes, there were computers. And there were smaller computers rather than big mainframes. Things are starting to get smaller but we didn't have an abundance of laptops or desktop computers. And we weren't carrying computers around um, in our pocket. In fact, in 1979, if you had a really good calculator, you were special. So our technology has really, really changed. Um, with all those changes though, we are still pointing back to this document from 1979 created by this one commission. So I want to talk today in three different areas. Um, I wanna start with some Kantu time travel. I want to talk about the present, and then I wanna do some look ahead to the future. And because I just find this photo fascinating, here is this photo again. By the way, this is the only photo I have found of the people who worked on Kantu. So as someone put in chat, yes, the president was Jimmy Carter. Kantu, this uh, National Commission on New Technological Uses of Copyrighted Works was commissioned 
They did a report uh, issued in 1979. It was for President Carter and for Congress. And it was to think about copyright and uh, access to copyright materials dealing with computer and machine duplication systems. So thinking a bit more broadly than what I and many other people tend to remember about Contu, and I think that's important. This was a broader look at duplication than um, just interlibrary loan. So I had two main areas, computers and copyright, which is chapter three, and machine reproduction, in essence, photocopying, which is chapter four. There's other chapters there, but those are the two main sections. And again, when I ever hear the, the acronym CONTU mentioned, I only hear it in terms of interlibrary loan. So a very narrow focus of what actually occurred in this document. And I'm gonna focus not on computers. You know, con there's been so much technology change since 1979. So I'm not gonna even look at that section. But I wanna pull out some information um, from chapter four, and I think from the introduction. And get us to think about what they were thinking about, right? You know, they had some things on their mind, and I think it's important to kind of look back to see what was on their mind at the time and what it really means for us now. So first, they had, the, the commission had no recommended changes except, and I love the word except because except means in many documents that there's gonna be other things coming up. This is the one thing they're gonna mention, but they're gonna talk about other things that could possibly be changes or recommendations. And I see that in this document too. The one recommended change that they uh, were thinking about was exception, uh, or excuse me, the one exception deals with photocopying by organizations that are in the business of making copies. In the business of making copies. So time travel with me back as far back as you can go, uh, maybe to 1979. And you might um, remember that there used to be copy shops, businesses set up just for making photocopies. Now these came out of the old print shops, printers, who you could take things to and they would print them for you. Printers gave way to duplication services photocopy. Photocopiers used to be much more expensive than they are now and rare. Your organization was special if it had a pho photocopier, very special if it had a very expensive photocopier. So there were businesses that did this work that made photocopies. And so they're thinking like, okay, there's these businesses that do this work. Maybe we should think about um, what this means in terms of copyright. 1979. Could you, if I asked you, name a business near you whose focus is making photocopies? You might think of the UPS store, the FedEx store maybe something else. But those businesses are shipping places that probably still have a photocopier for making lots of copies. So this has changed over the years. Photocopiers have been, have proliferated uh, across organizations. And so these types of businesses really don't exist anymore. And I find this interesting as I look back at Contu. Um, they want some continued assessment about copyright proprietors and users and balancing uh, the balance between them under photocopying provisions in the law. I don't 
think that they've done that continued assessment. But this commission you know, wanted some continued work done. And I find it fascinating and disheartening and everything else that um, the continued work that they wanted, the continued review, got dropped or maybe got done for a small portion of time and then kind of faded away. Now, like every commission, many groups, many study groups, they have a time period where they're active and then they disperse and they hope someone else will take up the work and people don't. And so that continued assessment um, didn't happen. We'll see that occurring in other places too. They recognized that there were commercial organizations that were doing photocopying on demand and for profit. And depending on your age and where you've worked, like me, I remember these organizations. These were wonderful for-profit businesses that would do, in essence, interlibrary loan or more appropriately, document delivery on demand. They would use their own collections if they had collections or the collections of academic and public libraries near them to fulfill requests. They didn't generally fulfill requests for everyday individuals. I think they often fulfilled requests for perhaps academic institutions and for-profit businesses um, and research organizations. In other words, people who had money. And so as a former corporate librarian, I can tell you that I used these types of commercial organizations to find articles for me um, to make the copies and to send the copies to me to give to a user. Do these exist anymore? I don't think so. I don't think so. So here's something that they were thinking about in 1979 that was a going concern that did last for a couple of decades. And then our photocopiers got more dispersed, more people had access to them, the technology changed, and the need for these businesses shifted and went away. So again, interesting for me to see where they were thinking and what has changed. The emphasis here on change. Um, and uh, in terms of interlibrary loan, um, they thought about um, having organizations, institutions, public or private, that would exist just for doing interlibrary loan, being a central source for photocopies. Did that happen? Maybe it did in some ways. Maybe we have larger institutions, larger libraries who are net givers, net senders in terms of interlibrary loan, um, but it probably didn't occur in the way that they thought. So they tried to think forward, but things progressed a bit differently. Uh, but interesting, again, in terms of interlibrary loan, that they saw something that could occur. And this may be my last one in looking backwards. Um, uh, they thought about technology changes and wondering if the owners of copyright materials would use technology to serve up what they had, to serve up what they had. And we've seen this a bit more, but probably not in the way that they envisioned it. Since 1979, we have many more online databases. And we went from having databases that were just titles and citations to having databases that had abstracts, to having databases that had full text and full text searchable, to having databases now that not only are full text searchable, but will serve up PDFs. So better versions of those articles. 
So yes, this has occurred, but not everyone has access to these databases. Not everyone can afford them, even if they could uh, maybe gain access. They might not be able to afford to get those articles because you know that there's really a cost behind the scene. Uh, but they saw that maybe this would occur and maybe this would impact interlibrary loan. And you could probably tell me that, yes, it has impacted interlibrary loan, that people can obtain many articles without making an interlibrary loan request. But this hasn't caused interlibrary loan to go away. So this change, these changes that they saw that could have changed interlibrary loan even more drastically didn't have that effect. What has affected interlibrary loan has been technology and made it faster, smarter, better, um, but it has not caused it to go away. And I do have one more recommendation uh, from Kantu, and this one I wish they had done. They wanted publishers, libraries, and government agencies to cooperate on making information about copyright status for all published works, both current and older publications, more readily available to the public. And when I read this recommendation, I think of orphan works. I think of the works where there isn't a lot of information known, maybe no information known. Maybe we don't know how to find that copyright owner. In 1979, if we had started compiling information on the work that existed then, and maybe looking backwards, I think we would have better information about what these things now we call orphan works. There would not be so many orphans, perhaps. But this didn't happen. And for me, for someone who um, has to explain this awkward thing called orphan works to students and to other people. This one really hits me hard. Um, I wish that, that this had occurred, that this recommendation really had gone into force. So that's the past. That's the past. They looked ahead and try to think about what was coming and what the impact would be. And they hoped that the work would continue, this looking ahead, this making changes to the law or making changes to other things. You know, they wanted that work to continue. But it didn't. Yes. Things have happened since 1979. There have been changes in the law. Um, there have been many technology changes, but our focus got diverted in 1979, 1980 to other things, other political things, just other things. And then our focus on Con 2 didn't look at everything that was in the document, but narrowed down to a few things that were in the document. So I want to move forward and think about um, the present and think about what we're doing now, what our libraries are now, and what interlibrary loan fits in, and kind of hopefully pull some of that past forward a bit. And again, questions, put them in chat because I really like interaction and I'm hoping that there'll be great interaction at the end. For me, in teaching, I put interlibrary loan in with the provision of materials. And I like the word provision. The fact that libraries furnish, procure, supply, authenticate, make available, whatever word you want to use, obtain materials, for our users. This is collection development. You know, collection development, some people think of the print collection 
And that is separate from the digital collection, which is separate from other things. But for me, collection development is all these things put together, all these ways we provision materials for our users put together, including interlibrary loan. People come to us, they ask for materials, and we say, yes, we can get that material for you. We can order it. We can borrow it through our lending system from someplace else that we have, that we're a lending partner with. We can interlibrary loan it. We can do perhaps other things, right? But there are all ways of provisioning materials. If a person is blind or visually impaired, we can get things on audio, we can get braille. Um, you know, if someone just doesn't like to read printed materials, we can get the audiobook. Again, all formats, all formats. I think we need to talk about provisioning of materials and all the formats together and their importance. I'm in meetings where people talk about interlibrary loan off to the side. And they don't pull it together with everything else. It's that thing that we do. And we don't talk about how we do it. We don't talk about its importance to our community. We don't talk about how it helps round out and expand our collections. But that's what Interlibrary Loan does. That's part of this entire provision of materials that our libraries do. And so, I hope you'll think about telling a broader story about your collections and what's in your collections and that interlibrary loan is part of your overarching collection development. Tell the story so people understand it. Not in jargon that you understand, um, but in ways that they will understand. And maybe you don't even call it interlibrary loan. You phrase it in some other way. Um, but they need to understand its importance. And they need to understand that we've been doing it for a very, very long time. I started with 1979, but we've been doing this longer than that. We've been sharing materials longer than that. So talk about its long history. Talk about people's connection to it, the impact it's had on them. Talk about how fast we can do it. Yes, I know, sometimes things still take two weeks, but not everything. Talk about how we make materials more accessible and what that means. It means to everyone. Talk about how it provides equity um, to our community. And I know from um, what was said up front, that you're interested in diversity and inclusion. So connect this history of interlibrary loan to diversity and inclusion. Make it part of that story that you're telling, part of the provision of materials. Um, and again, I just wanna emphasize that provisioning is much bigger, much, much bigger than how we tend to think about it. So wrap your, your arms around it, wrap your mind around it, and really um, anchor interlibrary loan into this, this larger story, this larger narrative, and show its importance to your community. Now, um, in teaching about collection development and about libraries, I think about two different libraries, the classic library and the new library. And so the classic library is what you think a classic library is. It's those things that are frequently collected. Those things that if you ask someone on the street, what is in a library, they would name these things. 
books and journals, DVDs, newspapers. Some would mention government documents. These are things that are frequently collected across all of our libraries. Not every library will have the same thing, but many libraries will have you know, that book. So that book is not rare, it's everywhere. There are also things that are in a few collections, and these are things that people will note as being in a classic library. Special collections, local history, archival materials. If it's an academic library, then dissertations and theses. And again, an academic library might have faculty writings, maybe even student writings. So again, if you asked people what's in the library, they're going to think of these things. These are the things that they would name in some fashion, um, whether they're talking about an academic library or a public library. By the way, as a former corporate librarian, those special items might be um, reports, internal reports, maybe published, excuse me, purchased external reports, and lab notebooks. You know, an organization that does research creates lab notebooks. These are documenting their research efforts, and those get stored in the technical library, perhaps, or in the archives. Um, so again, things are in a few, maybe just one collection. Now, in the classic library, there is interlibrary loan. We share things that are in that top section. You know, those are the things that perhaps people are frequently looking for. Their library doesn't have that book, that journal, that DVD, and so they want to share it someplace else. They might also want uh, things through interlibrary loan that are in a few collections, maybe something that's been specially collected, um, a, re a, a report, maybe a dissertation, or something else. And I'm heartened to hear that you're talking about how you share things that are in special, unique collections. Um, these are things that should not be tucked away. These are things that should find a way of being shared. Since we've been digitizing materials since the late 1990s, we've been digitizing and sharing materials that were generally speaking, free of copyright, uh, free of copyright protection. So older materials. And what wasn't being shared as frequently were things that were still under copyright protection. So our view of history has been skewed. If you're a young person in school and looking at what has been digitized, you might think history stopped in the 1920s because you're seeing all this older materials. So having access to newer materials, either through a digitization effort that's putting them online or through interlibrary alone, really helps people round out their knowledge of the past and especially of the recent past. So interlibrary alone fits in to the classic library very nicely, by the way. There's also what I entitled the new library. And these are things that depending on the person, depending on the library, they might mention. So we know that most libraries have digital resources. They may be fee-based resources, they may be free resources, maybe connections to or links to things that are on the internet or things, digital things that have been donated to a library. Uh, but generally speaking, these are items that are widely available. Many libraries are going to have access to these resources, even though they don't own the resources. So that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but access to these resources, widely available. These are things that we might have interlibrary loaned in the past, 1979, 1985, 1990, uh, but we don't have to interlibrary loan now because there's access to them through a database. 
Again, not everyone will have access to those databases, and so they might still require interlibrary loan. The new library also contains two things that are appropriate for you. Research data, so you might be asked, your library might be asked to store research data, data from research efforts of your institution, maybe data from research efforts of people in your region. Researchers who are not associated with an institution but need to have their data stored for the future. And so there's research data. I don't know that we've gotten good at storing and making research data available. My suspicion is that this is still an area that we're learning about and experimenting in, um, but this is something that will grow, is growing. Um, and is a need for the researchers and for the people who want to duplicate their efforts or understand better what they did. If you think about the last year and COVID, you can think about the research that has been done around vaccines, around the spread of COVID, around the impact on the community and wanting to share that data. And that might be shared through academic institutions. There's also learning objects. And this past year is a wonderful um, opportunity to think about learning objects. We all have been creating lectures, presentations, tests, um, self-study items, whatever you want to call it, learning objects for a while so this is not new but we did a lot more of it in the last 18 months we shouldn't be just making objects and keeping them to ourselves we should be sharing them in some fashion either within our institution with our consortia or more broadly speaking now, in the past, what faculty would share were the syllabi. Someone might contact me and say, hey, you teach copyright, can you send me your syllabus? And I would say, yes, it's easy to share that. But why should that person create all of their learning objects from scratch? Couldn't we share those learning objects and um, kind of, combine our knowledge, wouldn't that be wonderful? So those things are being put into libraries in some fashion, maybe not your library, maybe they're in your IT department or someplace else on campus, but you really, you, your library really should be involved in understanding what's there, um, how to catalog it, how to uh, ensure that people keep it, understand it, and how to make it shareable. Interlibrary loan might not be something that's happening right now with research data or learning objects, but perhaps something you should be thinking about for the future. Thinking about maybe a little bit of planning, maybe a little bit of how do we just share this among a consortia or among whatever. Um, better to think now than to have to do it in a hurry later. Now, just thinking back a bit to CON2 and to uh, the Interlibrary Loan Code of the United States. When was the last time you read that document? Um, there are two things in the code I wanna point out and they do for me connect back to CON2. The code asks us to be able to ship materials by the fastest method reasonably available to the location specified by the requesting library. Con2, in a way, was thinking about that, thinking about databases, thinking about uh, technology, thinking about uh, different ways of duplicating materials. We still need to be thinking about 
what's the fastest method possible? And recognize that the interlibrary loan code wants us to do that, wants us to be fast. And so in your later sessions today, when you talk about controlled digital lending and talk about other things that are technology oriented, remember that we're being asked to do this work fast. They want us to use technology. And 5.11 .11 says deliver copies electronically whenever possible, whenever possible. So again, use technology. This connects with the past, connects with our future. Now, um, in response to some of the questions I saw that you had put in the survey, let me just mention that fair use always works, always. We can always rely on fair use. In the past 18 months, there were things that publishers, I'm thinking about story time, by the way, publishers said, oh, we give you permission. No. We can use fair use for that. So exercise fair use. Get back into fair use. Recognize when you can rely on fair use for interlibrary loan. Yes, look at section 108 for interlibrary loan. And then look at fair use. That's actually a recommendation that's back in older documents. You know, yes. Interlibrary loan, use it. But if for some reason you can't use interlibrary loan, see if you can do that sharing through fair use. For teaching, for the, your learning management system, we have the TEACH Act. I don't have enough time to talk about that here, but the TEACH Act is complicated. Yes, it works, but also fair use works. So if your faculty are thinking about putting materials online for instruction, have them look at the TEACH Act, get them comfortable with the TEACH Act and what it says, and then look at fair use. And yes, I know that there are guidelines. Um, there are interlibrary loan guidelines, CON2. There are other guidelines that we look at, that we abide by, but they're guidelines. And as someone who teaches about copyright, someone who advises about copyright, I don't like guidelines. I really don't. Guidelines narrow what you can do. They put a number on things. You can share 20%, five lines, whatever it might be. Rather than saying what's fair. Guidelines are meant for people who don't understand copyright, whom you just want to give some rules to um, and have them follow the rules. And in many situations, that's fine. But the guidelines don't work everywhere. And so for me and for many others, the guidelines are limiting. So understand what guidelines you're following and why. And then understand when you want to break those guidelines, when you want to do something different. Have a way that people can actually ask that the guidelines be broken. You know, be willing to work with people a bit more on what they want rather than just strictly following the guidelines. I know you're gonna be talking about digital lending, that you have been talking about digital lending. Um, digital lending, I like to say digital lending in a controlled environment. Some people, when they hear controlled digital lending, they freak out a bit because they don't know what it means, but it's digital lending and controlling the environment in which that is done. So the things on this slide are important if you're thinking about digital lending, that you're using um, materials that have been purchased for our community, 
your low, low materials uh, is what we do. We purchase materials for our community. We do that. We lend materials to our community because that's what we do. In this digital lending, we lend to the ratio of what we have, what we own. So an own to loan ratio, that's really important. We don't over loan the materials. And I just want you to know, and I know that some of you are already thinking about this, that there are many libraries doing controlled digital lending, some under the radar, because they know that when you say controlled digital lending, people freak out. And so if you're talking about controlled digital lending, I really encourage you to understand that this is part of what we do, this lending, but also get comfortable thinking about it, talking about it in a different way. And so I like to talk about lending, that it's what we do, and kind of work people through maybe interlibrary loan, interlibrary loan digitally, um, that we lend digitally, and then get them to digital lending in a controlled environment and what that means. Because I find if I get people to say, oh yes, we do that, we do that, we do that, they will say yes for controlled digital lending. Okay, so let's get to the future. And again, questions, please post them in chat. The last 18 months will not be the last emergency that we will ever have. This image here is from Hurricane Agnes, which I lived through in 1972, so before Contu. Um, but you can see this orange and red and purple and see where it hit. It was devastating. Um, I can still go back to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and Elmira, New York, where, where I went to college and see the effects of this storm because I know where to look. So this was devastating. COVID was devastating. Hurricanes are devastating. You know, you need to prepare for the next emergency. So take what you've learned, and I'm sure you're already doing this. And, and document it. You know that copyright law supports library processes. Maybe you learned something new about that in the last 18 months. You had different thoughts, different ways of applying fair use. Document it. Take those scribbled notes or those notes in your computer somewhere and put them in an organized fashion where you can find them later. You know that fair use always works. If you did something different than you had thought about before in terms of fair use, again, document that. If there were lectures, if there were webinars, whatever that you went through that were helpful in terms of fair use, find those slides, keep a copy of the slides, find a recording, you know, just keep track of that information because you're gonna need it again. Recognize that 2020 was a stress test for us. It wasn't a emergency like a storm where you can see the storm coming and you have time to prepare. COVID just hit. We saw it coming, but we didn't have that preparation. So suddenly we're shut down. Suddenly, suddenly we're working virtually. What did that mean for you? What lessons did you learn? What did that mean for doing interlibrary loan? And what did it mean, not just for you as, a, you, as a, um, a staff member, but for your users? What changes from the, from the last year do you want to continue? Do you need to tweak any workflows? Did you tweak a workflow and now you need to like make it better? Make that tweak permanently. No? Take time. And then what documentation do you need to create? Anything? I think you probably do have documentation you need to create. If the past year made you think differently about this thing called Contu, 
if it made you think about tossing it out the window, or maybe you did toss it out the window, document why, document what that meant for you. Put that thinking somewhere, because that's important. That will help you again in the future. You really, in the future, need to affirm library and user rights. We have the right to own, to read, to preserve. Advocate for those things. Advocate for it for paper materials and for digital materials. You need to coordinate your advocacy more broadly. Rely on your normal advocates. That's probably your state library association, ALA, um, whatever groups are your normal advocates. But you also need to reach out to your library adjacent advocates, teachers, school districts, um, teachers unions, whomever can help you kind of broaden your advocacy around usage of materials, around digitization, around um, expanding access, around whatever it might be. And your advocacy needs to be loud. Why? Because the publishers are loud, very loud. The one thing that happened last year, and again, pointing to story time, which I know you don't care about, um, but publishers said, we give you permission to use our books for story time when permission was not needed. But by giving permission, they made people think they need permission. We need permission. No, they were loud about that. We need to be louder than them. We need to be loud at the state level and at the national level. Um, we need to update copyright law around digital lending, the right to repair. We need to look at federal legislation. Uh, we need to look at possible state legislation. And at the state level, people are looking at licensing, not copyright, uh, so adjacent to copyright. But it's a way of kind of helping us get access to materials, making our licenses more fair for libraries. And so a law is going into effect on January 1st in Maryland. A law failed in Rhode Island. Uh, there's a law passed in New York State that is waiting to be sent to the governor that would do something with licensing, library licensing, and hopefully uh, make it better for libraries. Finally, we need to think about the future of Kantu. Um, that thing in the past, we need to look forward. We need to have us in the room along with libraries, excuse me, along with authors and publishers. But we need to lead it. We need to lead it. We need to focus this work on our communities, the needs of our communities. We need to affirm our right to provision materials in all forms. And we need to have guidelines. If there are guidelines, I'd love to just do away with guidelines. Uh, but we need to have guidelines that are not so number oriented because numbers are limiting. So not so number oriented. We, you and I, library staff need to lead in the future. We need to lead on what this is for us in the future. We have to be in the room. We weren't so present in that room 42 years ago. We need to be present in the room now. So let me just say, this is how you can find me, uh, digitization101.com. I write mostly about copyright these days. I'm on Twitter, I have a website. You can ask me copyright questions uh, through a number of different ways. I, I encourage that. And now I'd like to open up for the questions you've perhaps put in chat or the questions that you have not yet put in chat. 